quite a finish there. Welcome to Lakeside Presbyterian Church, Easter Sunday, 2023. If this is your first time here, please be sure you get one of our welcome bags. Tell us about our beliefs, our outreach, uh, in various information about the church, and inside is our little cookie for you to enjoy. If after the service you would like a tour of this facility, this building, please either contact Pastor Carolyn or me, and we'll be glad to show you how we serve God here at Lakeside Presbyterian with our outreach and various facilities. Flowers today were donated by Phyllis Jensen in honor of her father's 99th birthday. Now he's gone on ahead, but it's good to honor a man who lived through 98 years, I believe it was. <clears throat> In front of you should be a prayer request form. Please, if you have a prayer request or a praise note, put that on there, put it in the collection plate or hand it to Pastor Carolyn or me after the service. Also, if you wanna be on our email list to receive our prayer request updates and on WhatsApp, Please complete one of these. We can also uh, print a name tag for you, so you'll be more than welcome to come back and be with us. The announcements are on the back of the bulletin, most notably Wednesday, the Bible study group. Uh, after church, we'll have the coffee hour out in the, the uh, narthex, again, a chance to meet and talk with uh, visitors and a chance to meet and talk with members of our Lakeside Presbyterian family. Is anyone going north that can take mail and drop it in the United States? Okay, uh, after church, you can either down here raise your hand again or over here, Michael, okay. So now please stand as we prepare to worship. And join me in the bold face type. Alleluia, Christ is risen. He is risen indeed, Alleluia. Praise the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. He has given us new life and hope. He has raised Jesus from the dead. Alleluia, Christ is risen. Let us pray. Faithful one whose word is life, come with saving power to free our praise, inspire our prayer, and shape our lives for the kingdom of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Now please remain standing and join in our first songs of worship and praise, and remain standing for the responsive reading.
Please join me in reading the bold face type. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. Let Israel say, his love endures forever. The Lord is my strength and my defense. He has become my salvation. Shouts of joy and victory resound in the tents of the righteous. The Lord's right hand has done mighty things. The Lord's right hand is lifted high. The Lord's right hand has done mighty things. I will not die but live and will proclaim what the Lord has done. The Lord has chastened me severely, but he has not given me over to death. Open for me the gates of the righteous. I will enter and give thanks to the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord through which the righteous may enter. I will give you thanks for you answered me. You have become my salvation. The stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. The Lord has done this and it is marvelous in our eyes. The Lord has done it this very day. Let us rejoice today and be glad. You may be seated. Our first reading this morning is from Jeremiah 31, verses 1 through 6. At that time, declares the Lord, I will be the God of all the families of Israel, and they will be my people. This is what the Lord says. The people who survive the sword will find favor in the wilderness. I will come to give rest to Israel. The Lord appeared to us in the past, saying, I have loved you with an everlasting love. I have draw drawn you with unfailing kindness. I will build you up again, and you, virgin Israel, will be rebuilt. Again, you will take up your timbrels and go out to dance with the joyful. Again, you will plant vineyards on the hills of Samaria. The farmers will plant them and enjoy their fruit. There will be a day when watchmen cry out on the hills of Ephraim, Come, let us go up to Zion, to the Lord of God. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You may remain seated for our next song. Our second reading is Acts 10, verses 34 through 43. 
Then Peter began to speak. I now realize how true it is that God does not show favoritism, but accepts from every nation the one who fears him and does what is right. You know the message of God sent to the people of Israel, announcing the good news of peace through Jesus Christ, who is Lord of all. You know what has happened throughout the province of Judea, beginning in Galilee after the baptism that John preached, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power, and how he went around doing good and healing all who were under the power of the devil, because God was with him. We are witnesses of everything he did in the country of the Jews and in Jerusalem. They killed him by hanging him on a cross. But God raised him from the dead on the third day and caused him to be seen. He was not seen by all the people, but by witnesses whom God had already chosen, by us who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. He commanded us to preach to the people and to testify he is the one whom God appointed as judge of the living and the dead. All the prophets testify about him that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Now please stand for a reading of the Gospel. A reading of the Gospel according to John. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. So she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one Jesus loved, and said, They have taken our Lord out of the tomb, and we don't know where they've put him. So Peter and the other disciple started for the tomb. Both were running. But the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent over and looked in at the strips of linen lying there, but did not go in. Then Simon Peter came along behind him and went straight into the tomb. He saw the strips of linen lying there, as well as the cloth that had been wrapped around Jesus' head. The cloth was still lying in its place, separate from the linen. Finally, the other disciple who had reached the tomb first also went inside. He saw and believed. They still did not understand from scripture that Jesus had to rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to where they were staying. Now Mary stood outside the tomb crying. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb and saw two angels in white, seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and the other at the foot. They asked her, woman, why are you crying? They have taken my Lord away, she said, and I don't know where they have put him. At this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not realize that it was Jesus. He asked her, Woman, why are you crying? Who is it you're looking for? Thinking he was the gardener, she said, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have put him, and I will get him. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned toward him and cried out in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said, Do not hold on to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them, I am ascending to my father and your father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went to the disciples with the news, I have seen the Lord, and she told them that he had said these things to her. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, you, O Christ. On this most holy of days, the one whom men had thought to destroy has risen triumphant from the tomb. My friends, let us rejoice. Alleluia. 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 Jesus is risen. On this holy day, we celebrate the new life that is ours through the risen Christ. Through the death of Jesus, the weight of our sins has been lifted from us. Through his glorious resurrection, we have become sons and daughters of God. So let us rejoice. Alleluia. Alleluia, alleluia. Come, let us praise the living God, joyfully sing to our Savior. Please remain standing and sing our next songs.
seated. And I'm going to give Francisco a minute to find the slide where we're supposed to be. That was my fault. I put my sermon slides in the wrong place. I knew something was going to go wrong this morning. <laughs> so, alleluia, Christ is risen. He is risen indeed, alleluia. Every Easter, we talk about it. We walk through Lent in preparation for it. We solemnly sit through a somber Good Friday service. And now, now we praise God for Jesus rising from the dead. But why? What's the point? Well, of course, there are several points. Because Jesus' death and resurrection changed everything. And really continues to change everything. Let me back up for a moment and say that not only is the resurrection the most significant event in the history of the world, it's also true that you can't call yourself a Christian if you don't believe in the resurrection. Well, of course you can call yourself whatever you want, but um, belief in the resurrection is core. It's one of the few essentials that true Christ followers need to believe. And Paul said, as it says up on the screen, if you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. That's the plainest plan of salvation verse we have. So now many, many people today really hate the idea of miracles. And of course, resurrection is the biggest miracle of all. They say that their belief in science is greater than their belief in an all-powerful God. Well, I believe in science as well, of course. I also believe that God is powerful enough to break the rules of science. He does so on rare occasion, and we call those occasions miracles. I'm going to go down a little bit of a rabbit trail here, side note. Some atheists argue that if God existed, he would be doing miracles all the time. He would suspend the law of cause and effect so that no matter what people do, no one would be harmed. That's their definition of a good God. However, and I want to say unfortunately, but I don't think it's unfortunate. Fortunately, God set things up very differently. He created a good world with the potential for evil. People have chosen evil, and he set it up so that there are consequences for that. There's an amusing quote attributed to Albert Einstein that says, there are only two ways to live your life. One is as though nothing is a miracle, and the other is as though everything is a miracle. And I don't know if Einstein really literally said that, but if it's true, I'm going to have to put myself in that second category. Everything is a miracle. Existence is a miracle. Just that there's anything. Life, life, that's a miracle. How about human consciousness on top of that? That's a miracle. But I'm not going to try to convince you of God's existence this morning. I'm not going to try to prove that miracles sometimes happen. And I'm not going to try to prove to you that Jesus indeed rose from the dead. Because there are tons of books written on this topic, and we only have 20 minutes or so. I, I looked at Norm because he thinks I'm going to go on for about four hours. I'm going to ask you to come along with me on a what-if-it's-really-true journey today. If it really happened, what does the resurrection mean for us right now? Well, the resurrection is evidence that backs up everything Jesus said and did during his life on earth. If it's true, it's proof that he is the Messiah that he claimed to be. The Messiah not just to the Jews, but to the whole world. The Jews of Jesus' time and most faithful Jews today believed that the Messiah was going to come to save Israel. But God had promised that Israel would save the whole world. And Israel did that through Jesus the Messiah. That's what Jesus rising from the grave proved. The Apostle Paul says that the resurrection also proves that Jesus is God's son and our king. Paul says in 1 Corinthians, For us there is but one God, the Father, from whom all things came and for whom we live. And there is but one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom all things came and through whom we live. Paul puts Jesus and God on equal footing. Jesus' resurrection proves that. 
And by calling Jesus Lord, Paul also put Jesus above Caesar. There's only one king, and Caesar wasn't it. And that's true today as well. Christians bow the knee to no one except Jesus Christ. Jesus' resurrection proved that Jesus is more powerful than death, and that his death freed us from slavery to sin. Jesus' resurrection proved that he fulfilled the law and was able to pay on our behalf the penalty of death required by the law. Without the resurrection, we might be able to say that we believe that Jesus paid the penalty, but there wouldn't really be a whole lot of proof. But the resurrection proves it. Paul says in Romans, God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement through the shedding of his blood to be received by faith. Atonement, that's a big word, and that's the word that means Jesus paid for our sins. So imagine you were a faithful Jew living before the resurrection. The forgiveness, the guidance, the presence of God was really only available to one man one day a year. The Day of Atonement, it was called. Yom Kippur, we call it. And when he made this sacrifice to God and met with God in the Holy of Holies in the temple, that was it. That was the one time. And it's significant to me that Jesus chose to be crucified not on Yom Kippur, but at Passover. Because Passover celebrates the Israelites' release from slavery in Egypt. This, too, is a huge reason for Jesus' death and resurrection. We can be freed from slavery to sin. Yes, Jesus does make this atoning sacrifice, for sure. But if that were the only point, wouldn't he have chosen to die on Yom Kippur? I quote Paul here, again, when I say, it is for freedom that Christ has set us free. That's Passover. The Day of Atonement is a day of fasting to cleanse yourself from sin. Passover is a day of feasting in celebration of God's salvation. Yay! So yes, Jesus died for our salvation and he atoned for our sins and he rose from the dead to prove that we are free from sin. The resurrection is also the reason why we're able to know that one day we too will be resurrected. Paul calls Jesus the first fruits of the new creation by the resurrection, but Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. In other words, we can believe that we will be resurrected from the dead when Jesus returns. We can believe it because Jesus was resurrected first. Paul gives us a very moving glimpse of what this will be like. Look, he says, I will tell you a mystery. We will not all die, but we will all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet. But the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. God's plan for his people in Christ are so good. The sure hope that believers have that one day the whole creation will be made new and all will be made right. Just like Jesus' resurrected body was different from the physical body that had died. When creation is made new, God himself will dwell among his people and he will wipe every tear from their eyes and more than that, there will be no more death and no more pain or mourning or crying. He will wipe away every tear. In the new heaven and the new earth, Jesus will reign fully and forever, and everything will be as it should be. So as we think back to the glorious resurrection of Christ this Easter morning, we can also glory in our own future resurrection in him. But it's not just about going to heaven when we die, although that's pretty cool. <laughs> because of the resurrection, we can live differently here and now. It should make a difference in our moment-by-moment -moment walk with God in this life. When Jesus rose from the tomb, he gave to the world a new kind of love and a new kind of life. He gave us eternal life. And in this present life, because of his spirit who lives in us, we can have the power to destroy greed and evil and bitterness and hatred. In Jesus' resurrection, we can see that Satan can be defeated and evil can be dominated by God's love. When you realize what the resurrection of Jesus can do for the whole human race, you have to stand in awe. 
One of the most exciting themes of all the New Testament is that this resurrection power is available to Christians like us right now. Paul describes it this way. He says, if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies because of his spirit who lives in you. And that is a lot of power. Resurrection power can overcome anything. So here's the thing about resurrection, about believing in your heart that Jesus was raised from the dead. It is transformational. Yes, at the final resurrection, we will all be changed. But if we're doing this faith thing right, right now, we should be starting on that change right now. If we really believe Jesus is our Lord, we should be doing what he commanded. A New Testament scholar that I really like named N.T. Wright, says, never get so wrapped in, up in your salvation that you forget what you're saved for. And we are saved to change the world now in this life. So how do we know that for a fact that the resurrection is transformational? Well, you can see exactly what the resurrection did for Jesus' disciples. We had our Tenebrae service this past Friday, and we heard the Matthew account of what happened on Good Friday, and starting at a, around midnight. And we, of course, pay attention to what happens to Jesus on that day. But we also see how at every step of the way, even before Good Friday, the disciples disappoint. During the Last Supper, Jesus tells his friends that one of them will betray him and that they'll all abandon him. And they respond by telling Jesus, hey, you've underestimated us. And then they argue among themselves about who's the greatest and who's the most loyal disciple. I will never betray you. And then, later on in Gethsemane, they fall asleep more than once. They're just too weak to be a friend to Jesus when he was desperate for a friend. And then they panic when the arrest comes and draw swords and cut off ears. And finally, they all run away. Next in a scene that is recounted in cringeworthy detail, Peter swears up and down that he doesn't know Jesus, even though it's pretty obvious to everyone around him that he does. When you look at the human side of Holy Week, what you see is that everyone deserted him and fled. They bumbled through that week. First they're arrogant, then they're afraid, and then they're hiding. They were cowardly, they were disloyal, they were unfaithful. These are the martyrs, the saints. They are Jesus' dearest friends, and they failed miserably and utterly at the time of greatest crisis when courage was most needed. It's heartbreaking. We watch Peter fall apart, weeping after the third rooster crow, and Judas backpedaling, trying to return the blood money that he went after. From the majority of Jesus' followers, we just get silence. They ran away. One thing is clear, the crucifixion is not a story of the triumphant early church or the hero apostles. The founders of our faith come off pretty badly. Yet within weeks, these men were proclaiming the gospel with such abandon that now, thousands of years later, we believe because of their teaching and their testimony. What turned them around? It was the resurrection. According to the New Testament scholars, like my friend N.T. Wright, every other ancient messianic movement would either dissolve when their leader died or they'd appoint a new leader to be their messiah. It would have made sense if the disciples had abandoned Jesus' teachings or if they had proclaimed James, the brother of Jesus, as the new hope of the world, but they didn't. Instead, they preached a resurrected messiah, an idea so absurd that even they didn't believe it until they saw the risen Jesus themselves. And when they saw him and believed, their lives changed. The early church was born, and it proclaimed the good news of Jesus as the hope of the world, eternal, unchanging, risen, and coming back. Transformation starts with us. We Christian believers are Jesus' followers, his representatives, his body on earth. We are God's temple. We are to be holy, even as God is holy. This church building... This isn't God's temple. This is not a dwelling place for God. The only dwelling place for God is in Jesus' followers. His spirit lives in each one of us. 
Many of us feel discouraged when we look at what's happening in the world, and we may wonder why God doesn't do something to change things. But here's the thing. God changes the world through us. In fact, God is saving the world through us, the one holy united church. Our salvation points to and embodies in advance the kingdom that Jesus is bringing to earth. This is the whole hope that is ours because of what happened during that weekend 2,000 years ago. Our ultimate hope is not just about going to heaven when we die. It's the new heaven and the new earth. In Revelation 21.5, Jesus says, I am making everything new. One day Jesus will make all things that exist new and better and fuller and more complete. This is when God will do for us and for all creation what he did for Jesus at Easter. The resurrected Jesus was still the same Jesus who had lived for 33 years on the earth and worked among his disciples for three of those years, but he was changed. He was new. He was more. He was resurrected. That fact is transformational. Let's remember it and act on it every day of our lives. Amen. Pastor Carolyn, thank you for clearing up the Einstein thing. I thought he, with a hairstyle like mine, I thought I'd spot him when he came in. But obviously, he's not here today. Now it's our time of thanksgiving through tithes and offerings. Let us pray. God of great gifts, this morning we give you praise. We give you glory. We give you thanks. With resurrection humming in our hearts, our minds are turned to your song of peace. We joyfully present these gifts to you, a tangible chorus of thanksgiving, a harmony of hope for your kingdom come. Amen. stand and join in the doxology. We now come to our time of communion when we share together in the body and blood of Jesus in recognition 
of his great sacrifice for us. Here at Lakeside Presbyterian, we practice open communion, which means all baptized believers in Jesus Christ may share at this table. But this is not to be taken lightly. As the Apostle Paul wrote to the church in Corinth about taking in this communion. It's not the cup of thanksgiving for which we give thanks, participation in the blood of Christ. And it's not the bread that we break, a participation in the body of Christ. Because there is one loaf, we who are many are one body, for we all partake of the one loaf. Therefore, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. A man ought to examine himself before he eats of the bread and drinks of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without recognizing the body of the Lord eats and drinks judgment on himself. And so now as we prepare to come to the table, let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Father, through your word and Holy Spirit, you created all things, and we praise you for that. But we also come before you now, confessing that we're, you are great and strong. We are weak and uncertain. We confess that we have failed to love you with our whole heart, soul, and mind. And we confess that we have failed to love our neighbors as ourselves. Too often, Lord, we've ignored your commandments, strayed from your way, and followed other gods and other priorities, no matter how shallow these priorities may have been. Our sins are large before us, Father. We bring them now to you. Hear us and forgive us, we pray, Lord, as each of us, in the silence of our own hearts, confess to you our sins. Holy God, holy and mighty, have mercy on us. Have mercy on us, Lord, for we are ashamed and sorry for all our sins, and we do repent. Forgive us, please, and raise us to new life, that we may serve you faithfully and give honor to your holy name. For the sake of Jesus Christ, your Son, and our Savior. Amen. Dear friends, hear now the good news. We know that God does not see as we see. He is able to see into our hearts. For that reason, we can be assured that we as we have felt sorrow for our sins, confess them to God and ask for his forgiveness, he is faithful in wiping away all those sins and giving us new life in him. We can rejoice that we are a forgiven people. Amen. Now some instructions. After the words of institution, the ushers will release the rows from the back to come down the center aisle. There will be two stations, and please be served from the station on your side of the aisle. Once you've received the elements, go back down the side aisles to return to your seat. If you're unable to come forward, we'll bring the elements to you immediately after others have been served. And as a sign that we take this communion as a celebration of our personal relationship, please eat the bread immediately as you receive it. And it's a sign that we also share in this communion as the community that is the body of Christ. Please take the cup back to your seat with you, and we will all drink together after everyone has been served. In the beginning, God created us for himself. But even though we have fallen through our disobedience to sin and to death, God in his infinite mercy, grace, and love sent his only begotten Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, to live among us. He suffered every hardship and adversity, every trial, trouble, and temptation that we face, except without sin. Finally, he stretched his arms out on the cross in perfect obedience to the will of the Father and offered himself as a sacrifice for the whole world. On the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread. And when he had given thanks for it, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. 
Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, after supper, he took the cup, and after he had blessed it, he said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this in remembrance of me. Jesus said, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. Therefore, as often as we eat the bread and drink the cup in faith, remembering his death and resurrection until he comes again. May the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ keep you unto eternal life, the gifts of God for the people of God.
gifts of God for the people of God. Take and feed on them in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving. Let's pray. Almighty and ever-living God, we thank you that you have fed us with the holy mysteries of the body and blood of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. We thank you also that you have assured us of your favor and goodness towards us by making us members of the mystical body of your Son, which is the company of all faithful people, heirs through hope of your everlasting kingdom. We humbly ask you, Heavenly Father, to assist us with your grace that we may continue to do all such good, good works as you have prepared for us to walk in. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be all honor and glory, world without end. Amen. friends, today we have celebrated the glorious mystery of Christ's death and resurrection. We may now look forward to the future, in fut a future in which we can be assured that because Jesus had triumphed over death, we now have hope for eternity. Let us, Let us go, go forth rejoicing in the knowledge that Jesus is alive and, and that we, we have been redeemed. redeemed. Hallelujah. Please join us after the service for coffee in the narthex. Blessed week.